Hey everyone, welcome back. This is episode 22 of Christian History and Ideas. I'm John Coleman, and I'm joined today, or I am joining, Dr. Nirmal Das. How's it going, Dr. Das? Great to be here, John. How's, how's it going with you? It's going. It's chugging along. 2021 is uh, is quite a, quite a, a year, as there have been a lot of other quite a year. So we're doing exactly, well. yes. <laughs> All right, so we're looking today, continuing really our discussions over the past uh, three shows of Christianity in the East. In, uh, we began with Tibet. We're going to return to Tibet today. In the intervening times, we also looked at larger our Christian history in China, as well as um, the whole subject of the Church of the East and Nestorianism and uh, some very interesting cultural looks as well as artistic looks of uh, a huge uh, slice of, of church history, which is pretty much completely forgotten in the West. So um, as is our custom, we will begin with a, uh, a text and this recording we happen to have uh, appropriate again to the time of our episode being filmed, as well as to this topic of, um, of the gospel and the gospel spreading, especially to far-flung areas. We have the antiphon at known from the uh, time of Epiphany in the Liturgy of the Hours. So the antiphon reads, I have raised you up as a light for all the nations. Through you, my salvation will be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. So with that, Dr. Das, I'll kick it back to you and let me know when you want me to bring up the different artworks and quotes and all these uh, goodies that we have. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, so I thought we would continue our discussion um, <clears throat> by heading a little bit south um, and look at Christianity in Tibet. Um, last time we talked, you had mentioned that very interesting uh, article you, you were looking at. Uh, with that church in Tibet, and um, I thought we would, you know, dig a little deeper and see that that church was not some, you know, anomaly that you know just kind of happened to be there, but rather <clears throat> it's part of a very old, I would say, ancient tradition of Christianity in that part of the world, and that's what I would like to, um, you know, dig into a bit here um, and to look at how old this is and uh, what kind of Christian tradition existed in this part of the world. Um, <clears throat> to set the context, I guess, is that we've been looking at this time period of about 600 to about 900. <clears throat> and this is really the dynamic period for um, Eastern Christianity. Thanks, John. Uh, and also, if you wouldn't mind, John, if you could pull up a map of what I would like to talk about, and that is the Tibetan Empire. Uh, it's mm. one of the empires that few people talk about or know about. Uh, but it was a very dynamic part of, uh, of that part of the world <coughs> that we should uh, consider. Um, so if you could, yeah, uh, just bring that up if you could. Um, I think that blue is really good or this at the bottom. On um, the second one over? Yeah, uh, the second, the first one in the second row. First one in the second row. Ah, yes, great. I don't know who makes these maps, but they're very helpful. <laughs> yeah, they're good. <laughs> I feel like they take a lot of time to make. Uh, yeah, it's very small, but maybe you could, yeah, there we go. Ah, good. Uh, yeah, so notice how huge that is. <clears throat> so it, it encompasses parts of China, India, uh, Central Asia. So when we're talking about the, 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 the Tibetan Empire, uh, <clears throat> we're looking at a very uh, influential uh, um, culture, <clears throat> for lack of a better term. Uh, and this existed um, from about the early parts of 600 AD to about mid 800, I think about 840, 842 or something like that AD, um, that's when it starts to break apart. So it has a 300 year run <clears throat> as a very powerful empire in this part of the world. Uh, and because it's a powerful empire, it exerts a lot of influence uh, around the area, which also then means, of course, that Tibet was not as we understand it to be, i.e. a backwater of a backwater of a backwater, uh, you know, cut off from everywhere, um, <clears throat> a land unknown, 
a land of mystery and so forth that somehow is a fossil, uh, you know, from some ancient time period. No, <clears throat> we're looking at an area that was very dynamic, very much understood itself to be part of the larger world. Um, and indeed ruled, uh, you know, various different portions of that larger world. Um, and because it was part and parcel of this larger world, it was well aware of say the Persian empire, the Roman empire, and it had communication with those two empires, i.e. merchants, um, <clears throat> embassies, um, you know, political influence, uh, political dynamics, all of that sort of thing was going on uh, at this time with the Tibetan uh, world. Um, so when we're talking about Christianity, which we've been discussing so far, we've talked about the monasteries <clears throat> uh, that were around in this part of the world. We talked about the influence uh, um, you know, settlements and so forth. Um, and no, given the extent of this uh, empire, it would be, of course, uh, wrong for us to think that we're talking about an isolation, uh, nation, isolated nation. Um, and since it was obviously not such, um, what we're also then talking about is that the Tibetan empire was heavily influenced and um, evangelized by the Christian faith. And of course, again, this is the Christian faith of the Church of the East, uh, the church that belonged in the Persian Empire rather than the church that belonged in the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and as such, Tibet, of course, uh, preserved a lot of its ancient Christian uh, uh, history. Uh, and that we're now slowly discovering, uh, which is really interesting. Again, like I said last time, um, when we start looking at this sort of dynamic, uh, we have to then keep in mind that when we're talking about um, the more normative faith system of this time, of this area now, Buddhism, again, Buddhism is not a religion that comes out of uh, a vacuum. It's part and parcel of a, a very uh, deep context. And that context is heavily Christian in this part of the world. And that we have to keep in mind always. <clears throat> we should get away from that habit of thinking that uh, these things or these places are, are, are isolated uh, and what we're looking at are fossils of very ancient traditions that somehow evolved all on their own. Uh, and now we have the benefit of going and visiting them and touching something really pristine and ancient. Um, that's a nice... Know, that's always the danger of... Um, it's the, it's the double-edged sword, isn't it, of, of categories, um, whether those are historical epochs or physical territorial borders or intellectual categories, is that they can be extremely incisive and illuminating to a reality, but um, they, they lose the nuance of the reality, oddly enough, by their categorization. Exactly. Uh, and it, they, they also then lead us astray. Yes. We, you know, we somehow think that we know it more, we know it better than, say, what happened back then or, or whatever. Uh, it gives us a certain kind of an arrogance, <clears throat> which I think is always fatal um, to a historical understanding uh, of reality. Um, uh, and I think it's also something we discussed earlier. It's part and parcel of this uh, fabulism that is part of the modern mindset, i.e. we're all back in Plato's cave staring at the wall and the images on it. Um, uh, we love staring at the images and we create all kinds of fables around those things. And this isolation of the East is one of those big fables. Um, part and parcel is is the whole education system, what we call Orientalism and oh, all this. Where's my Saeed? Where's my I, I, Exactly, your Saeed. <laughs> <laughs> it's right out of my, I was just, I just, had, I, here, hold on. Here's one of his books. It's not Orientalism, but here's, uh, in, in, in... John, get rid of the, the map. I can't see, we can't see. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can't see Orientalism. You're going to have to define that for us, Dr. Doss. So Edward, Saeed, Edward Saeed, there we go. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, what sorts of Orientalism? He he made it famous back in the 70s. John, you want to address it quickly? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, Orientalism is this concept um, which um, was the title of a book by Edward Said, who is this Palestinian-American um, scholar from... And uh, Christian, by the way. Yes, he was, yes. Um, what do you... Was it NYU? Or he was down in New York, anyway. Yeah. 
And he noticed, um, you know, the, the elephant in front of everyone, which is this concept of the Orient, um, which Westerners such as ourselves kick around. And this concept that he delineates in this, um, and originally an essay, which was published, I think, in 76 as a, as a book called Orientalism, he notices that these characteristics that when the when Westerners are talking about the Orient, they, they are meaning the Middle East and or everything um, across North Africa to the Middle East, and that they use the exact same term for all these people, um, and that uh, they all seem to have the character, they're, they're there seems to be, uh, if you look at the artwork and so forth, I have a presentation on, on my own uh, channel about that book where I give you artwork and things. So there's a lot of sensuality in the artwork. Um, there's a lot of lethargy. And also in the way people speak and portray, Westerners portray the East, there's a lot of lethargy. Uh, there's usually some use of narcotics, um, you know, the, the hookah or whatever. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's also violence uh, at the same time, oftentimes. There's also very often a, a monument in the background uh, that's decaying. <laughs> so everyone's like loafing around in like, you know, some temple or something from a thousand years before. Um, and also this idea um, in Orientalism that um, one, one place is interchangeable and one time period with another place and time period completely removed. Saeed gives the example um, of, re <laughs> he was reading... Um, I believe it, he was trying to find out about Syria, and this guy was was talking about Syria in the 18th in the 19th century, and Said was reading about this um, explanation, and he says this sounds very familiar. I've read this somewhere, and it's actually from like some guy from the 1700s talking about Egypt or Libya, <laughs> but something. And this is the whole point of Orientalism. I think I've I've expressed it here, in, um, and and Dr. Daskin asked for more clarifications, but the whole point is that. Westerners use this term in this final example, you know, from 200 years before, from a thousand miles away, and they apply it to a totally different area. But in the Western mind, all of that could be the Orient. And that book um, really torpedoed the whole, the whole uh, discipline of Orientalism. Um, no one except for old Bernard Lewis until, <laughs> until into the 21st century was still declaring themselves an Orientalist after Saeed. Exactly, that's a great summary. Uh, <clears throat> exactly right. Um, and so what we're really looking at then is an Orientalism uh, when we look at um, you know, these areas and when we talk about the context of Christianity uh, because we've made all these assumptions about the Orient and these assumptions lead us into all kinds of conclusions that have nothing to do with the historical reality of these places. And of course, one of those conclusions that Orientalism has given us is that of isolation, uh, that these all, cult all these cultures have been deeply isolated um, and it's only now that we're discovering them. <clears throat> and because we're discovering them just now, what they're presenting us is um, unique, uh, untouched, pure, uh, and so forth. Um, and this is a very powerful fable uh, because people, you know, um, uh, live by it, um, you know, the, the entire, <clears throat> you know, modern understanding of spirituality outside of Christianity depends upon this fable. Um, but it's, it's a very peculiar, um, you know, mindset. Um, so my point is, uh, with all of this, and it's a, it's, you know, it's a topic we should, you know, look at some other time. But the point is that what we're really talking about are um, situations, historical reality that is vastly different from what we assume it to be. Um, <clears throat> this is not what happened on the ground in Tibet. Tibet was not isolated, for example, to, you know, to go back to our discussion. It was not an isolated place. It wasn't a backwater of a backwater. Uh, it was a very dynamic uh, happening and rich area and influential area. Uh, and I think that's the key. So we should try to break away from this Orientalist habit of mind that we're so much in love with, uh, which is of course, minimizing uh, uh, the Oriental or Eastern cultures. But more importantly, I think it is uh, uh, hindering us from fully understanding 
what is going on. <clears throat> so we need to shed our basic assumptions about these places and open up our understanding uh, to, to, to you know, greater horizons. Um, having said that, um, what we're really talking about then is that um, Tibet <clears throat> has had a very, very ancient and very deep connection uh, with Christianity. Um, and yes, John is showing us the, the more famous cover of Orientalism. And if um, I could interject, um, sure. it took sure. Saeed a very long time to figure this out. So I'm just relaying what he said in one of his final interviews, a very interesting three hour presentation before he died of, I think, leukemia. Um, you'll notice in the upper, um, the upper bar, bef bef below the title, and then above this thing, it says the 25th anniversary. You see um, a lot of these squiggles that kind of look like Arabic. Right. Um, and, and they certainly do look like Arabic. They're actually not, right? It's total gibberish. But this, right. this is a good example. So you have the sensuality with the violence, with the lethargy, um, with the white guy, a little bit higher than all the black guys that are all loafing around, with the temple that was once great, but it's kind of decaying. Um, this is a good, perfect snapshot of Orientalism. Great, yes. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I'll bring up the map there, Dr. Das. Sure, yes. Um, let's do that. All right. Here we go. Good. Um, <clears throat> so this is the area we're looking at. Now, <clears throat> again, this area had temples and churches and monasteries. Um, and in one of those monasteries, uh, we have had, uh, you know, various documents that we have found. Um, and, you know, we'll look at those in a minute. I don't want to jump ahead, uh, you know, before. But what I would like to start our discussion off with um, is a quotation from um, an e a patriarch or, uh, you know, archbishop of, of the Church of the East, uh, of a man by the name of Timothy the First. Um, and Timothy the First is right. In around um, 780 in a letter. And I would like, um, you know, to... Um, uh, for John to read that little bit um, and um, uh, for us, that letter, uh, and then we can discuss it. Absolutely. Here we go. Quote, man, your friend is named God Isho Mi I Shia Ha and acts as Varapa I Shir Sa Yamuri and when the doors of the heaven with seven layers will be opened, you will pursue the yoga, that is the way of conduct, that you will receive from the judge at the right hand of God. And what you will have thought, do it with shyness, unscared, undaunted. You will become a jinnah. You will become blissful, that is. There will be no demons of sickness or impediments. This lot for whatever cast is very good. Now, notice something very interesting about this uh, little passage from a letter. Now, this letter, of course, is written by the bishop to, <clears throat> sorry, to the, by the arch, what we would call the archbishop or even the cardinal, um, to uh, the church in Tibet. Um, and that uh, 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 idea of, uh, of addressing uh, a church in a particular area is, you know, very interesting historically. But the point is that this document um, informs us about the dynamics of the Christian of Christianity in this part of the world. Um, notice, first of all, <clears throat> uh, the name of Jesus that appears in the first line. Um, and this is Isho. Um, and this is the Syriac version of um, uh, the more normative Semitic form of Jesus's name. Uh, Ar do you know that in Arabic, uh, John? In Arabic, it's um, in, in proper Arabic, it's a Yeshua al Masiya. Yeah. And then uh, in the Islamic world, uh, from the Quran, it's, he's called Isa, but typically it's, it's Yeshua. Yeah. So this is a combination of, uh, this is probably a, a very early 
uh, Semitic version of Yeshua or Isho um, it comes down to, and of course the second part is uh, uh, is Meshika, uh, which is uh, in again in Arabic Mesiha. Um, but again, Messiah is what we know this term as. But notice how uh, central that concept is. So your friend uh, <clears throat> is a God named uh, Jesus the Messiah. Uh, this is what we're suggesting. And this is to mankind, all of it, uh, all of mankind, that your friend is this God. Uh, and notice, Jesus is not referred to as a prophet or some guy, but as a God. So again, the divinity of Christ is maintained by the Church of the East, as opposed to what people usually think about Nestorianism, i.e. the rejected God's, uh, sorry, uh, Christ's uh, divinity, his Godhood. Um, and... <clears throat> Uh, we can forget the, the various uh, terminologies like the Vajrapani and the Shri Sakyamuni and all that. Um, but what the interesting thing is that when it refers to the heavens, it says it has seven layers, i.e. there's seven heavens uh, that we're talking about. <clears throat> this is a very ancient, um, this is a very ancient um, 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 Christian Jewish uh, understanding of heaven that heaven has these various layers, um, uh, just like, you know, Dante has the layers of hell and also the, of, of uh, heaven and all this sort of thing. It's a very ancient uh, um, uh, understanding of what, uh, what the, the, the geography of heaven is all about. Uh, and the highest is where Jesus and God live. Uh, and um, the other thing I would like us to, to take a look at in this uh, passage um, <clears throat> is that Jesus is referred to as a judge and he sits on the right hand of God. Um, <clears throat> this is, these two terms are very familiar to us, of course, um, as Christians, because these are something very uh, understandable because they're creedal. Um, they're, they're part of our creed that we know quite well. Um, and uh, <clears throat> what this then suggests um, and... Um, uh, sorry, what this then suggests is that um, what we're really looking at is a creedal statement of the East. Um, and if we focus in on these three things, um, Jesus is God, <clears throat> Jesus in heaven, and Jesus judging and sitting at the right hand of God, notice it's not so radically different from what, you know, passes for, say, the Nicene Creed. Uh, or the, you know, um, that is what the creedal statements are. Um, so what we're then discussing here is that in Tibet, the context of Christianity is very, very traditional, for lack of a better term. Um, it isn't heretical in any shape or form. So again, the idea of Nestorianism as heretical breaks down completely from this document, uh, which is not, you know, something from outside uh, this area, but right inside the Tibetan Empire. Uh, this is where this document comes from. And it lays the, the, you know, lays the groundwork of the faith that we're talking about, the Christian faith that we're talking about. And I was was the uh, Church of the East, or indeed, is it um, in its Chicago home, a synodal church? Is it um, very uh, patriarchal? How, how Do you know how it might have been organized, especially at this time period, and how it would uh, delineate doctrine? Sure. Um, it was very much in the you know apostolic tradition of uh, the church um, um, hierarchy, uh, i.e. it had the patriarch and the archbishops and the bishops and the presbyters and all that sort of thing. And... Uh, what, how they communicated were through councils that they held um, and through, um, you know, uh, various uh, uh, synods. They did have synods as well. Uh, this is part of the, you know, uh, uh, the structure that was, that was uh, established. And it very much mirrored the structure in the West as well. Um, very similar to that in regard, um, in that regard. Um, what was different, of course, was what was expected of priests and bishops and all that sort of thing, i.e., whether they could be married or not and all that. <clears throat> that was what the main differences were. Um, but structurally, it was very similar to the one in the, in the West, i.e. it had the Synod, it had um, you know, the, 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 uh, the Episcopate uh, and so forth. 
uh, it, it followed through with all of that uh, structure that we're familiar with. Um, and more interestingly enough, uh, it also had a way method of communication, what we would call a mail system, i.e. so a letter like this could be written and sent all the way to Tibet. This letter was probably written in, uh, um, in what is now modern day Iraq, uh, probably um, um, perhaps Babylon, something in Edessa. Um, because this person, this patriarch Timothy the first, is a very mysterious, we don't really know too much about him. Um, as we don't know much about a lot of this stuff, actually, because it has been very little researched. Um, and it's very, not, you know, recently that we're just, you know, finding still documents and, and interpreting them. Um, so it had a very interesting uh, a dynamic mail, mail system, communication method, which would get, um, you know, um, probably using the Silk Road and the, you know, the, car the caravans going this way and that. <clears throat> But this mailing system allowed for very rapid communication uh, to happen. Uh, and of course also allowed for um, uh, ideas to spread very quickly. Um, so the point then is that um, when we talk about uh, say Tibet um, in this part of the world, uh, we're talking about a very established church. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not something that is foreign uh, to to, um, to anything uh, contextual that is Eastern. Uh, he, notice it's using the terminology that, are, that is familiar to people. Um, you know, the, the, the Sanskrit terms, uh, Vajrapani basically in Sanskrit means holder of authority, uh, power, you know, uh, 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 basically a holder, someone who holds authority. Um, Sakyamuni means um, he that, um, you know, helps you along, this is Sanskrit. Let's not say you Sanskrit, it's Prakrit a little later division version. Um, unlike Greek, Sanskrit did, of course, uh, you know, keep developing into different languages and so forth. Um, um, so notice it's using those terminologies that was familiar in this part of the world. It's not using Greek terminology. We would expect Greek terms to be used in this context in the West. Here, um, Sanskrit terms are being used, and of course, other um, uh, Persian words will be used or Sasanian. Um, Sogdian words will be used. These are Persian languages, uh, Persianate languages, I should say. Um, and um, <clears throat> that is the vocabulary, that is the, 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 the common context that is being deployed um, in order to convey, um, you know, the, 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 the Christian message. Uh, and that's the interesting thing here. So it's, it's a Christian message entirely removed from the Greek context. Um, and I think that is the key that we need to take away from all of this stuff. This is an entirely different, um, you know, uh, context, different uh, culture that we're dealing with. And yet the message, notice the creedal um, uh, version of the message is unchanged. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. He's the son of God, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, And the seven layered heaven and whatnot is just something interesting that we don't have to worry about, but it's there as well. Um, so it happens. Now, what I would like to suggest with this is that um, uh, the other things that have come out from these various uh, places in Tibet um, is uh, rock carvings of crosses, um, you know, with, uh, uh, there we go, um, uh, of crosses. And there's another one, John, that if you could, uh, um, Another one, can we keep going to the yep. last? Yeah, there we go. This is specifically Tibetan. Um, and if you uh, look at the top, um, top right hand. Um, Hold on, don't wanna go on Twitter. Hold on. Yeah, we don't wanna go to Twitter. Stand by, <laughs> try to blow it up and see what happens to for my, all my good deeds, see what happens to me. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to have to content ourselves with this one. Hold on now. Yeah, just leave it at that. that that'll be fine. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's good enough. Uh, but uh, what you have on the right hand is Sogdian, which is a Persianate language. Um, and it's, it should be, it, imagine it being, you know, flipping right over. And so it's standing on its, you know, uh, up. And you would uh, read it uh, from top to bottom. Uh, that's how you're going to be reading it. Um, yeah, if you just, yeah, that's it. Um, it's a very difficult uh, passage, by the way, to interpret. Um, 
but it seems to be saying um, uh, that, you know, this was written in some, this time period, where it's a very contentious thing. The scholars don't really know what this means. It's a very uh, difficult, uh, for some reason, to, to interpret. Um, um, and what is, it's also suggesting is that it's uh, mentioning the word Jesus in there. Again, in, um, in, um, uh, in the normative version of Jesus's name in this part of the world, which is Isa. It's no longer Isho anymore. Isho, uh, you know, uh, I think is, is a Sanskritized version of the, of the, of the Arabic, uh, of the, I should say Syriac, I shouldn't say Arabic. Um, and, but at this time now, Isa is becoming the normal, uh, and this text mentions Isa, is becoming the normal um, uh, form of Jesus's name in this part of the world. In and the is East. that because of Islamic influence or? Uh, no, that's later, but really in the, it's a Syriac, Persian influence. Mm. Yeah, Islam is not gonna be influencing this part of the world yet. Um, but Islam is gonna be influenced by these kinds of, this tradition as well. Um, so, um, so they're using the, the term Isa shows up here and uh, Messiha becomes part of that phrase as well. So Jesus and Messiah together are mentioned in the Sogdian uh, text to the right uh, on top. Now to the bottom, of course, obviously, uh, <clears throat> is the cross and notice it's the Eastern cross, i.e. commonly known as the Nestorian cross. Uh, we might as well use that term because that's what they use. But anyway, it's the Eastern uh, Cross. But notice, interestingly enough, it's a cross that is emerging out of two petals. And this is probably the lotus petal that is being depicted here. Uh, and so the cross is emerging out of the lotus. Of course, the lotus is going to have a lot of, inf uh, um, you know, um, uh, it's a heavy duty iconography, uh, you know, in, in Buddhism. But notice it's preceding Buddhist iconography. Um, and this is the interesting thing. So we have an earlier version of the lotus being used in a religious context, but that context is not Buddhist. That context obviously is Christian. Um, and this, like I said, this is a specifically Tibetan um, 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 artifact, a uh, remnant, and it points to something very interesting. Uh, again, uh, two things. First, um, you know, the prevalence of an iconography that is going to be adopted later on by Buddhism, the lotus, um, and thereby afterwards that into Hinduism as well. And secondly, um, the use of Sogdian, which is a Persian language, so it's not the language of the natives of, the, of Tibet, uh, but it's the universal language that is being used for universal communication. Just like we would use language, you know, English for, functions this way in our world. We assume that everyone will know English if we put something out and you, you usually do. It is the universal language. In that part of the world, the universal language was Sogdian or a Persian version of the Persian language. Um, and that was the prevalent uh, language used throughout this area. Everyone spoke it, it was the common tongue. And this again, we talked, touched about this recently, uh, but we'll mention it again, it's worth mentioning. When we're talking about language in this context, in the ancient world generally, but especially in the East, we're talking about language, we're not talking about unilingualism, we're talking about multilingualism. Most people could speak two or three or even four languages. Why? Because you needed that many languages to get by in the world. Uh, you couldn't just speak one language and have a good life. Uh, but if you wanted to communicate with the world around you, you needed more than one language. And usually that meant knowing two to three to four languages. So this tells us then uh, that Tibetan culture is not cut off. Uh, it's part of the larger Persian Empire, or there's certainly not, I shouldn't say that way. It's, it's aware of the Persian Empire and wants to communicate with it because it's an empire in its own regard. And, and it's probably regarded as such uh, uh, by the Persian uh, uh, world. Uh, and notice how you know, closely it, uh, in that map, closely uh, it merges with the Persian mm. world. Um, so um, 
because of this kind of internationalism of the of the Tibetan world, um, it's not surprising, therefore, to find this kind of um, uh, influence or presence of Christianity. Um, and uh, the other thing I should mention is that, um, and by the way, there are a lot of these uh, um, Christian crosses in Tibet. And interestingly enough, um, they're difficult to find um, you know, on the internet. It's difficult to find images of them. Um, and it's only in very hard to get books that these books, these images have been printed. Um, I have not been able to get a hold of these books uh, for the very simple reason is because they're very expensive to buy. Uh, because they're, you know, they were printed in the early 1900s, uh, printed in the early 1930s and 20s and so forth. And a lot of them are in German and French. Um, because that's who was doing a lot of the work in this part of the world. Um, and so they're very difficult to find. Um, and, but I would encourage people to you know, look around. You never know. Um, and if you do come across these things, do put them on the internet so people, other people can see. So some you know, gracious soul has put this image up for us to look at. Uh, but there are other crosses that have been found in Tibet, quite a few of them. Um, and they should be you know, more widely known, but unfortunately, since uh, they're hard to get. And I don't know what the situation is now in Tibet, so what, you know, what has happened or what is going on, uh, whether these you know, things are still around to be photographed. Uh, but if, you know, the point is there's a lot of this kind of, these kinds of artifacts that were found in the early parts of the 1900s. Uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, probably most of them are in museums, um, but, Unfortunately, they're not so easily available for us to look at. So this was the best I could come up with to give us an idea. But they do follow this same, same sort of pattern. And uh, because they follow this sort of pattern, it's really interesting to see them, um, um, you know, to see them in their, in their context. Um, the other thing I would suggest with uh, Tibetan, uh, uh, with Tibetan uh, Christianity is that um, it had a very um, deep influence, but it was a it was a faith system that was not openly rejected. Um, this idea of Christianity disappearing from these parts of the world is part of a very active uh, political effort. Um, first by Buddhism, then by, in this part of the world by Lamaism, the Lamaist uh, faith system, and. Uh, you know, for, thirdly, uh, through various political actions, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, and those political actions, of course, are going to be perpetrated by the next version of Christianity that gains a foothold and then creates, becomes dominant, and that is Islam. Um, because Islam is part and parcel, it, of course, doesn't emerge out of some vacuum, but it's coming out of this tradition of the East Church of the East. Um, that is its context. And um, it is uh, the Church of the East's version of Arianism. That's what, you know, for, for the context. Uh, just that uh, the Roman uh, Empire had Arianism, um, the Church of the East had um, uh, Islam uh, to contend with. In the West, the dynamic was different. Arianism was overcome. In the East, the dynamic was different. Christianity, the Church of the East was overcome by its version of Arianism. And of course, this is what we have today. Um, so we, in a way, we still have the Christian world that was there in the East. Um, it's only been dominated by one heresy of that church, um, of the Church of the East. And that has become the dominant faith system. Uh, whereas the normative Orthodox system that was there, the faith system disappeared or became marginal, marginalized. Um, and of course, that was through political means. Uh, we briefly talked about the Mongols um, and their, you know, um, their dynamic um, in the sense that they were promoting Christianity always and didn't like uh, Islam um, because by this time, Islam is, of course, now emerging and it, Islam probably emerges in the Persian Empire. So this idea, we can talk about this some other time, the early history of Islam, but uh, this idea that Islam bursts out of Mecca and Medina and uh, out of Saudi Arabia is, is a fable. 
um, it probably is um, uh, it's um, it part and parcel of the uh, the most uh, it's it comes out of the largest Christian city in this area, which John you mentioned last time. You might want to talk about it again. Merv, Merv, exactly. was it? Merv or Marv or Merv, exactly, which is a Persian uh, 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 city. But the center of early Christian, uh, sorry, of early Islam is in that city as well. Um, and it comes out of the monastic traditions of the, of the Church of the East um, and various, you know, arguments about what is what, about oh, Jesus and all that sort of thing. So the best way to look at it, uh, you know, we can get talk about it some other time, uh, but the best way to look at it is that it's, it's the Church of the East version of Arianism, i.e. questioning the status of, God, uh, of Jesus' God, Godhood. Um, and by questioning uh, Jesus' divinity, you come up with all these different things, i.e. Arianism in the West and uh, um, Christian, uh, sorry, Islam in the East. Uh, but the point is that this widespread faith system um, is not, uh, is certainly uh, dismantled, but it's dismantled in order that it be, might be replaced by another version of what has always been there. So we're not looking at the dynamic of conquest. Mm. This whole idea of, you know, Arabs bursting out and killing everybody in the millions and all that sort of thing. It's a very difficult thing to, we can talk about this again some other time, but it's a very difficult thing to pinpoint in history and especially in archaeology. So if you're going to talk about, you know, Arabs bursting out and just taking over the world, um, where's the archaeological evidence for it? You know, it's a very difficult thing to find. Um, and that shouldn't be so given how dynamic it was. So what instead... And how married to written text as well. I'm sorry? And how married um, the generation was to written texts and, and so forth. And, and exactly. traditions, and oral traditions and recounting things of that, that early generation. Exactly, exactly, yes, yes. Um, so what we're really, really talking about is simply Christians that just flipped over into this version of the faith. That's what happened. A lot um, of that happened too um, in North Africa as well. Um, exactly. Yes. And then perhaps it was a relief in the North African context. Maybe you can apply it to your knowledge of the far Asian context. Um, of a, in the West, so, so we'll see if you can respond to the East. In the West, it seems that people were really burned out with, um, well, the type of hair splitting and the type of sectarianism. And um, one of the charms of Islam is its, its simplicity, uh, doctrinally and so forth. Um, was that, would you say, was that an attractive point in the, uh, in the farther East? Um, was there the type of, um, you know, like you had the Donatists and the Catholics and things in North Africa going back and forth for centuries, really, on top of Arians, on top of other sorts? Um, was there that sort of wrangling? Do you think the acceptance of Islam there and its simplicity was uh, in reaction to that possible um, burnout? Uh, that kind of dynamic didn't really exist. The, that hair splitting did not happen in the East so much as in the West. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, second thing we have to be aware of, uh, this is just in the East again, uh, we have to be aware of is that when the flipping over into the Islam version of the faith happened, i.e. Islam version of Christianity happened, um, is it happens at a very particular time in history. It happens in the 14th century. Um, so it's not, um, <clears throat> it's not um, you know, uh, a general process, but it's a very a concerted political event. Um, and that political event is tied up with the personality of Tamerlane. Uh, we mentioned him last time, uh, but we have to always end up with him in the East because he basically destroys the Church of the East in the, in the, in the East. Um, and it's his, um, you know, it's his life work. He wants to do this. Um, and this is what he sets himself to do, to get rid of the heretics. Um, and just like, you know, think of it as a crusade. And in the East, the crusades are very successful. Um, and the crusader in the East is Tamerlane. And his crusade is to get rid of the heretics that are occupying Christian land <coughs> for him 
uh, and replacing the heresy with the true faith. Well, we are up on 45 minutes, believe it or not, already. Um, would, are there any other uh, photos or um, topics you would like to cover in this uh, regard? I think we're done. <clears throat> okay. I think our voices are done too, but we did a good go of it. And I think uh, we learned a lot. I certainly did. I, I, can, I can absolutely say that. Um, if anyone would like to uh, contact us, suggest possible show topics, or indeed uh, suggest and then offer yourself as an expert, you're more than welcome to write us at christianhistoryandideas at gmail.com. Um, also, any, you know, correspondence in general, how, if you benefited from the show, it's always um pleasant to receive such such uh, feedback and to keep a type of uh, intellectual community and uh, discourse going uh, behind the scenes there. So you're more than welcome for that. Uh, Dr. Das, please tell us something um, or a few things we might want to keep an eye out for in the postal this happy month of January. Uh, <clears throat> sure. Um, in the next, actually, in the next issue in February, <clears throat> frog in the throat, um, <laughs> Uh, we're getting a very interesting um, uh, interview <clears throat> with um, Austrian philosopher, um, Konrad Liesmann. And he's written a very interesting book called Education as Provocation. Um, <clears throat> it hasn't been translated into English yet, unfortunately. Um, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a book that discusses the failure of education system in the West, how um, we no longer need well-educated people, and yet we think we don't need well-educated people, and yet we do, um, because without well-educated people, we don't have a world. Um, and um, also, he looks at this idea of what, where democracy will end up if we keep doing what we're doing, <clears throat> which is uneducating people, de-skilling people, as, as opposed to skilling them with anything. So education, and then he gets into the dynamic of skill versus education. Um, where people go to universities or colleges because in order to get a better job. <clears throat> and of course, none of that happens. <laughs> um, so it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting um, um, interview. And I would encourage people to come by and, and have a look in February. This is going to be the February issue uh, that's going to be coming up. Excellent. Well, the Gmail uh, site and Dr. Das's postal, as well as uh, my announcement, they'll all be in the description here. And that is simply if you are uh, interested in the education world and in particular the, the current events in education, I do on my channel um, a bi-weekly uh, presentation on that very topic. So staying up to date with the field and um, if you're interested in, in uh, Dr. Das's and, and mine, uh, or our college, or however the grammar works after <laughs> two shows, you'll give us a break. Um, you can go to apocasastasisinstitute.wordpress.com and you can find out all about that. So we will sit on our next topic. We will not tell you what our next topic is, but it will be very worthwhile. So Dr. Das, as we leave everyone in great suspense, thank you for your expertise. Thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure. And thank you, viewers, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.